On today's episode of Locked On Phoenix Suns, why Devin Booker's return as the Suns kick off a four-game road trip with a win in Cleveland went about as well as the Suns could possibly ask for. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, a writer at suns.com and the host of the Just Basketball Show wherever you get your podcast. You can also get my thoughts on the Suns by joining the Locked On Suns Insider Community. If you're finding this show for the first time, you can hit follow or subscribe, get a new episode in your feed every single Monday through Friday. We're free and available everywhere, including YouTube. So just hit that button, become an everydayer, and get locked onto the Phoenix Suns all season long. Today's show brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Have you ever wondered what adventure could be around the next corner? We'll take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. 117-111, the final score. Phoenix Suns get a victory, move to 38-27. and And our moment of the game is going to be the third quarter because that was the most dominant stretch the Suns had. They get out to a little bit of a weak start defensively, in particular against Darius Garland. And Cleveland gets out to a lead. Surprisingly, without Donovan Mitchell, without Evan Mobley, without Max Struess, Dean Wade, who was the star of their comeback win against Boston last week, all out, and yet the Cavs still pull away early. Suns battle back in the second quarter, but the third quarter is where we focus in because it was just a perfect example of what the Suns can do on both ends of the court when they really put their heads down and execute when they get a little desperate, when they're tested a little bit, which is what they were in that first half. Obviously, it's always games like this are always tough, tough to parse, right? Because it's like you can get frustrated that it was even close in the first place. You can be bothered by some of the inconsistencies, but there is something to be said for the fact of responding. And not just effort and energy. And we talk about responding as this, like, it always has to be like a Disney movie. No, I think in this case, on the court stuff was just executed at a higher level in order to get the win. I would say the two main things, one on each side of the ball. Effort and execution, guarding Darius Garland. And on the offensive end, pace. You don't want to oversimplify things, but sometimes... It is just that simple. Defensively, I thought that their communication on coverage when Garland did get a screen was much better. Are we switching this? Are we sending two defenders toward Garland? Are we helping off of a shooter early to take away a driving lane? Suns had some good rotations where they were loading up help when Garland did get downhill on a drive. So times when he got toward the basket, maybe beat their pick and roll coverage, even with the extra effort against him, they did not collapse or lose focus late into a possession. They had a, he turned it over on one play on an interior pass where he was trying to kind of loop it back with a drop pass to, I believe, Allen under the basket. That was where Beal had a pick six, so to speak. And overall, it was just an example of, hey, we know the Suns do not have the type of stopper, especially with Josh Okogie out of the lineup, that they're going to, that they would ideally like to have, let's say, right? But I would say similar to moments against Jamal Murray last week. The Suns were able to do just enough, 
make an opposing score just uncomfortable enough to quiet them down and allow their offense to spread its wings. And that brings us to the other side of the ball. It might sound very, very basic, and maybe it is. But good things happen when the Suns just play quicker. Obviously, moments like that turnover on the Garland under the basket pass are easy pace-pushing opportunities. But in general, you can really just feel when this team has it going. When this team is playing loose and comfortable and confidently. I would say the Lakers game on the first Sunday after the All-Star break was a perfect example of what I'm talking about, where it it just feels different. It feels like a team, honestly to me, when this team is playing quick and with energy and, and wall-to-wall effort, that's when they feel like they can win a championship. You know, not to go 30,000 foot view out of this Cavs game, but but I'm just, that's that's it to me. And so they end up in that second quarter only missing five shots out of uh, 20 something. Nineteen, maybe, maybe they were fourteen of nineteen, and I want to say they had the fewest turnovers. That's just okay. Now they they had two turnovers in the second quarter, three, three turnovers in the second quarter. So not bad. And you look up, and at the end of. Oh, that's why am I saying second quarter? Confusing myself here. Third quarter is what we're talking about. My point was going to be that they took more shots, and then I got myself off track clicking the wrong button. 22 shot attempts in the third quarter. Believe that was the most of any period. And you look up, and it goes from a deficit at halftime of seven points to suddenly a six-point lead going into the fourth quarter that they held on to. Maybe it wasn't pretty, but they did hold on to it. And it was just possession by possession, right? It was not exactly... So the Suns had uh, three turnovers, I believe, in the third quarter as well. So three in the second, three in the third, and then eight combined in the first and fourth. That tracks. Again, possession by possession. Fourth quarter gets a little weird again. We're not going to focus on that today because they came out with the win. But that's what good teams do to, to, to depleted squads. On the road, you go in, you stick your, you, you keep your head up, you stick with it, put out fires, play your game as much as you can, let your best guys take over. That's what the Suns did. So, on that note, I thought this was the best game that I can remember from this big three in terms of balance. They picked up right where they left off in Book's first game back, and you have to feel great that they are continuing to develop layers and levels to their partnership heading into the stretch run of the season. We'll break down how it all looked coming up next. First, today's show brought to you by Better Help. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let them out, especially to someone who's unbiased about your life. So today, I'm going to get honest with you about something And you might even be thinking about the same thing this week. Just in the name of honesty here, folks, I miss Josh Okogie. He makes you want to pull your hair out. It's not fun to live and die by every three-pointer that he takes, every crazy drive to the basket and wild pass. 
but he is vital to this team. And I'm giving into it, and I'm starting to miss him. Authenticity, folks. Genuine honesty. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than Josh Okogie or, or our favorite sports team. And it's important to get those things especially off your chest every once in a while. So if you're th- thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Entirely online, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, let's break down the big three. Again, you don't even need me to tell you because the box score kind of tells you all you need to know on a night like this. But this, to me, was one of the better games I can remember of the balance and flow between Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker. Post game, KD called it spontaneous basketball, and I love that name for it. It really felt like tonight was a game where the Suns hit the vibe or the feel on offense that they've been striving for all season long. They they met their mark. They hit their mark, I think is the right phrase. Uh, 88 points, 17 assists, just six turnovers. By the way, I'm going to be breaking down this flow, this balance, and how it looked in that third quarter in a watchback of this game on Tuesday. Maybe even have it out Monday night. We'll see. So if... You want me talking through video, which a lot of you ask for during these podcast episodes, which I unfortunately cannot give to you because my channel would not be monetized if I was putting NBA footage on this channel. Not allowed to do that. But if you want more of that type of content, sign up for the Locked on Suns Insiders. You will not be disappointed. You can sign up at the link in the show description below or go to joinsubtext.com slash Locked on Suns. Again, click that link below. That's the easiest way to sign up. You have to confirm your sign up also, folks. So if you want to support the show, you want bonus content, you want my thoughts on game day, my thoughts about Suns news as we get toward the offseason, all of it, all through the playoffs and beyond, right there. But I will give you as granular as I can on the episode, of course, as well. So 88 points, 17 assists, just six turnovers, and they shot 35 of 67 from the field, better than 50%. But beyond all of that, in addition to the pace stuff that I just talked about in that third quarter and otherwise, I thought the flow between all of the actions and the touches and who was initiating versus who was spacing out versus who was screening, the communication to get quickly into those sets without me, uh, without dilly dallying, let's say, right? To use a very, you know, mother, mom, grandma phrase. I thought it was all very, very good tonight. To return to that phrase of spontaneous basketball. I couldn't describe it better myself. Salute to you, KD. You are not really a podcast host anymore, but maybe you should be. Because spontaneous is exactly the way to describe it because it highlights the randomness, which is valuable, right? It's, I don't, I I think the Suns would be worse off if they really truly tried to make Beal or Booker a straight up, point guard like in the traditional Chris Paul whoever Luka Doncic even uh, concept of that word where they're commandeering every single possession I think they would be worse I think playing this way is to the Suns benefit because of that randomness 
it's it it's good that when the Suns bring the ball up the court, A, you don't even know who's going to bring it up court. B, the defense doesn't know what's coming. Even if one guy has the ball, is that going to be that player running a pick and roll? Is it going to be that player entering it to Durant or Nurkic in the post? Is it going to be them running? They're finally running actual sets more consistently. Durant off of a elbow pin down. Spain pick and roll where either Beal or Booker can handle and either Beal or Booker or Allen can set that back screen and then pop up to the top of the key. I mean, we've been seeing those sets under Monty for years where Cam or Book would often be setting the screen. Chris would handle, Aiton would screen. In this offense with this talent, there's even more varieties of what that can look like. And they're getting into that stuff. So it's all great. But again... What I think we saw tonight, beyond the production, beyond the efficiency, beyond the pace even, was the decisiveness. And I think that's what Duran is speaking to when he calls it spontaneous as well, because spontaneous is a very different word than random. It's a very different word than unpredictable. Spontaneous indicates a level, I I know it's just a word, guys, but I think it's perfect, and I think it really drives home the point here. It indicates a level of purposefulness, right? Like, we've met people we would describe as spontaneous. It might come out of the blue, but when there's a when there's an idea in their head, they're committing to it. Let's go do this. Let's go to that. Let's try this. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to wear this outfit. I'm going to start this hobby. And it's dead set all of a sudden. And that's what the Suns need, too. They need the randomness, but it can't be random to them, you know? And I think tonight is, again, a a great example of that. A lot of the little things that you would have wanted to see just if you open up a box score when you're dreaming up what a big three should do happened in this game. They all took basically 20-plus shot attempts. Very important here for this team is, too, they all took seven or more threes, and they each had four or more assists. The Beal initiating stuff certainly translated in this game. Right away in the first quarter, Beal is the one running a lot of the offense. Then, a couple times in transition, a couple times as like a secondary attack, it's Booker with the ball in his hands. And then after a few minutes, they start to feed it to Durant in those usual extended post ISO situations. Now, they did run into a little bit of trouble there, but it was different guys running the pick and roll with Nurkic. It was, again, different guys running those Spain pick and rolls in transition. Everybody was eating. I just thought from start to finish, especially given this was a pretty close game, it wasn't just a blowout where they were feeling it and and loose as hell. This was a challenge, and they still managed to cycle through that stuff, be purposeful while also being random, a.k.a. spontaneous. And at the end of the game, the production is going to be on a freaking ESPN graphic tomorrow with some segment on... Well, let's save that <laughs> because I'm going to return to a post-game go-to rapid-fire segment to close out the show momentarily, touching on just that. First, got to talk about Yusuf Nurkic, and we'll do that next. First, today's show brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Have you ever wondered what adventure could be around the next corner? Well, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capability to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class-exclusive Google built-in is your always-updating assistant to call on for almost anything. And gone are the days of connecting your phone and dealing with Bluetooth and all the nonsense there. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store get the job done for you. Built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system, all combining to make the 2024 Rogue the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. 
In addition, the 2024 Nissan Armada will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, and Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Closing out the show, starting with the NERC report, which we have to do. I just decided to hit record while I looked for some clarity on what went down with Yusuf Nurkic. I am sorry to uh, let you know that I still do not know the answer to that question. Um, Dwayne Rankin, who is usually our trusty guy, and I believe he will have some updates um, as we move through Monday night here. I was hoping the 20 minutes it would take me to get to the NERC report would give them time. But it seems like Frank Vogel is not really talking uh, quickly today. Regardless, he got benched at the end of the game, as I'm sure you know, and as I was just alluding to there. But I guess bench might be too harsh of a word because I'm not exactly positive what happened. People have pointed out that Yusuf Nurkic, as a Muslim man, does observe Ramadan. And that could be maybe relating to some fatigue tonight. Maybe some, you know, digestion, di di digestive issues. I don't know. Totally would be understandable. I would just... The reason I'm not going to just say that that's for sure what it is, is one, that's just an assumption. But two, this is not his first go-around with this. So I guess I would just hope he's okay if that's the case because he's handled it in the past okay and hopefully nothing severe happened. But beyond that, this was a very strange Nurkic game. I'm saying this with all the respect in the world to him honoring his religious traditions. I, this is not intended to be making fun because, frankly, a lot of what we saw tonight is stuff that happens from Nurkic every game. The roller coaster ride that is the Nurk experience, aka, in our case, the Nurk report, where I walk you through it, okay? First of all, look no further than one of six from the free throw line. What's going on? I don't know. No clue. Zero assists. I couldn't tell you. I mean, I could look it up. The last time, if at all this season, that Yusuf Nurkic has had zero assists in a game that he has played real minutes in. Let us look. He has two games this year with zero assists, both of which he left early with injuries or other stuff or had foul trouble. Three, sorry. Okay, so the Portland game on November 21st is the only game this year where he played more than 20 minutes and had zero assists. So add this one to that group and uh, chalk it up to bizarre circumstances. On the positive note and a, a more real legitimate explanation for the assist stuff at the very least is he was just running straight up pick and roll a lot in this game and just getting opportunities to finish at the basket. That's why he got to the line as much as he did. The Suns offense was just kind of clicking with without having to really cycle in those particular sets without having to really do the give it to Nurkic on the short roll, he kicks it, they pass it around the arc and whatever. It was really kind of just more simple actions than that were working, so he didn't have to, and they weren't running a lot through him directly as a passer in the post. There were a couple possessions where they entered it to Nurkic and it became a three off of kind of a draw help, kick it out, et cetera type of situation. But on top of all of that, I thought this was a pretty strong defensive game from him. A lot of the damage that Garland did, in my opinion, or, I mean, really not my opinion, the stats show it, was from deep on pull-up threes and whatnot. And I don't blame Nurkic on that so much. So he had a, a lot of strong rim protection moments. I felt like his activity was solid. He had a couple of blocks, uh, one block, a couple of nice rim protection moments in terms of, you know, big kind of clean up the mess type of plays. And Yet he's not out there at the end of the game. And Drew, Drew Eubanks is, who obviously is a roller coaster in his own right. So I don't fully get it, but there you have it. Uh, still no updates from Mr. Rankin so far as I can tell. No. 
uh, on on the Nurkic situation. Um, so we shall see. Last but not least, uh, let's just talk quickly at box score oddity. Perimeter defense was an issue. The Cavs got up 46 threes. It's not every day that Niang and Merrill are going to combine to go one of 11. That is very much a you caught a team on the second night of a back-to-back type of luck that the Suns were able to to click into here. Uh, if if those guys shoot their normal level, I'm not sure if the Suns win this game. If I'm being honest with Garland, I mean even even in the second half, despite my celebration of the Suns' execution on defense and kind of focus and buckling down, Garland still got up a lot of opportunities and it's not like he fell off a cliff he had i want to say like 15 20 points in the first half finishes with 30 uh i think he had maybe 21 in the first half nine in the second half so okay like that's that's still pretty solid the other guys missing shots was what saved them so you know could have seen it coming i mean i said that to the locked on suns insiders who i sent out a preview message to this morning I said perimeter defense is A1 on the 1A on the game plan. You got to watch out for Garland and Lavert off the bounce and you got to watch for Merrill and Niang as catch and shoot guys. It, that all came true. They just happened to to miss some. All right. Now for last but not least in in reality here. Phoenix Suns pre-take I, I don't know. I'm trying to cook up the first take bottom third graphic or the get up bottom third graphic or the first things first, whatever. I'm not sure exactly what the question will be. I'm not sure what the debate, what the topic will be that everybody will get to bicker about on, on, the, on the TV show. But maybe best trio in the league, something like that. Are the Suns unbeatable? When the big three play this well, something like that. And I mean, yes, this game was close, but again, as I said, when they are playing that type of fast paced, spontaneous, to again use that buzzword, type of basketball, that is when to me, they do feel the most unbeatable. So yes, Mr. ESPN or Fox Sports One producer, if I'm if I'm on that panel, I'm saying, yeah, they're damn near unbeatable when they play like this. And again, it's not just the production. It is the cycling through. It is the fact that everybody got in on the fun and it was done in an efficient way with a healthy shot diet of all three levels on the court and obviously a win. So be prepared. Especially if the Suns can do a version of this on Thursday. Yeah, you're probably going to want to tune in and, you know, get the antidote. If you ever feel like the Suns get hated on by national TV, I know people like to think Doris Burke and Reggie Miller hate the Suns and whatever. Be watching this week if this stuff continues because this is what this team was all about. I mean, think back to last June, they make the Beal trade. This type of game is exactly what you... We're hoping to see, and you did it. You saw it tonight if you tuned in. If you didn't, well, you just got 30 minutes of me talking about it. You can also get me breaking it down, especially in specific that third quarter in a Phoenix Suns watchback exclusive to Locked on Suns insiders. Sign up at joinsubtext.com slash Locked on Suns or more easy, scroll down whether you're on audio or YouTube, click the link. It is in the show description every single day, even when I don't say it. Click there, and you have to follow through. You have to sign up, then you have to confirm your sign up, and then you will start receiving messages. Get that content, support the show, get my thoughts on the Suns every day, be in the know about the Suns all the time over there. I'll have another show for you on Wednesday, getting you ready for the rest of this road trip. I'll have Aaron Edwards on Thursday, and I will have a recap of Sun Celtics on Friday. So it should be a good week of content across everywhere you can find me. I'll catch you guys again tomorrow.